Jetsons or, or different kind of 50s movies, we had this idea of flying cars because we had planes and we had automobiles. So you put the two together. Um, I can't imagine that we are... Well, I mean, you know what? I, I can't say that I can't imagine, but it's difficult for me to imagine flying cars. But um, I know that when I was born and when I was growing up that I could not imagine the internet. I know that when I was born and I was growing up, I could not picture an iPod or an Amazon Kindle, um, these types of things that are futuristic and um, are in our midst. It's interesting how technology exists when we are ready for it. Um, and Kant has a response for this as we move on to 19. He says, you know, that's the difference between things. There are, things exist in and of itself. Um, things have a nature that we don't necessarily tap into. We can never understand the fullness of any object or any person or anything for that matter. So this is the ding and such um, or the thing in and of itself. So if we take clowns, for an example, um, here we have some examples of some pretty freaky deaky clowns. Um, on the far right, there is the It clown from Stephen King's It. Um, in the middle, there's our little friend, um, I don't remember his name, but he's from Saw, the Saw series. And then on the left, there's the uh, one of our, our killer clowns from outer space. Um, you know, when I was a small child, my brother sat me down and made me watch Stephen King's It, and um, clowns are pretty scary, and they scared me for quite some time. Now, what's interesting about this is that we've seen it in so many different aspects of our popular culture, so it must exist because there are so many different instances of these scary, creepy, deepy clowns around. And yet, if we move on to 20, nobody would say that that's the purpose of a clown. You know, the, the clown is not meant to be a scary thing. But somewhere along the lines, you know, some folks um, who maybe saw things a little bit differently, you know, again, maybe visionaries or creative types or artists, saw this as something to turn on its head. Um, so we take the clown. The clown is a... Um, a character that is meant to be mirthful and bring joy to children and let's make it really scary because what's worse than, you know, the most intimate and natural of um, things that bring joy to small children, what's worse than that attacking you as a child? You know, the things that you trust, clowns and teddy bears and things like that, things that are supposed to bring you um, enjoyment. So that is a part of the thing in and of itself. Now you, you probably are sitting there thinking that I'm going crazy at this point, but if it manifests itself in the outside world, then it has to exist in the nominal world. So clowns cannot just be pure, happy go lucky, friendly little creatures. They have to, within their, their nature, they have to be able to, um, you know, have that little evil streak in them, if you will. Um, so there are understandings of the clown that encompass everything that you think of clowns as well as everything that I think of clowns, as well as everything that your parents think of clowns, etc., etc., etc. It's it's a you know in clowndom in the nature of the clown, it's a big enough tent for all of us to to get along in, um, and it is that because the nature in the nominal world is big enough to support all of it. All right. Uh, so as we move on. To 21, we got a little all dogs go to heaven. Um, Kant did not, Kant, Kant was controversial <laughs> in his time period because he did not necessarily envision a religious system in the way that it was. He did not envision Christianity in the way that it was. He thought that instead, um, instead of all the rituals and the miracles and stuff like that, that we should and could, and it's appropriate to use religion um, to help people morally 
and ethically make the right decision. So therefore, religion should be focused on the following things, that that's, we, we focus on the community, and we focus on the idea that human beings have free will. He agreed with that. Human beings have the capacity to make right and wrong decisions, and that they discover what those right and wrong decisions are through trial and error. So, you know, and, and this is going to get confusing in a minute because it's not just trial and error. It's more than just trial and error. But, but one of the most fundamental ways that we understand what we do and don't do is through that idea of trial and error. So, um, for instance, you know, I, I talk often about my, my four-year-old nephew, Matthew, and my four-year-old nephew, Matthew, likes to inflict pain on other people. Um, and he does not have the capacity yet to understand that he is doing it. He thinks it's funny to see people in pain because he's a kid, you know. But eventually what will happen through a process of trial and error is that he will recognize that when he hits his brother, his brother hits him back. Um, and it's, it's kind of a reverse golden rule so that when um, his brother Sean hits him back or his brother Finn, who is, you know, six years older than he is, hits him back, it hurts. And that it might not be a good policy to um, hit people through trial and error, you know. And that's as you are developing as a young person, that's important. Move on to 22. So in summary... What do we know? Yes, we do have a uh, sensible, as we say, human animalistic needs. We need to sleep, eat, drink, relieve ourselves, etc., etc. As Berkeley put it, these are the material entities that we have. If we don't do these things, we will expire. We will die. But, and this is undeniable, you can see a picture of my sister-in-law up here in the corner. This is uh, Maureen and her twin, her identical twin sister, Michelle. Um, we also have beliefs, hopes, dreams, desires, emotions, and fears. These are not simply rational and physically explainable entities. All right? You can't get much closer in two human beings than twins, identical twins, and yet as any of you who have met identical twins know how different they can be in personality and dreams and ideas and hopes and lifestyle activities, etc., etc., etc. All right. So 23. So seriously, how should we act? Well, what we're seeing here is that we're living in flux between how we should act and how we do act. All right. And this is what's very interesting because he comes up with not only a hypothetical imperative, but also a categorical imperative. And this is very, very similar to Pedro Arupe's man for others kind of idea. All right. A hypothetical imperative is more or less selfishly driven. So I know that if I don't want people to... You know, Matthew knows that if he doesn't want his brother Sean or his brother Finn to punch him in the face, that he should not punch them in the face. All right. I know that if I want people to treat me with respect, that I should treat them with respect. <coughs> um, and to tell a very brief story, I went to when I went to St. Joseph's University down in Philadelphia. And I wish you could see me right now because I'm flapping up a storm um, here on December 27th. Um, but there was a young man I used to play rugby with, and we all had nicknames. My nickname is Smiley. Um, and this young gentleman's name was Dingleberry. And the reason why his nickname was Dingleberry was because at the beginning of the year meeting, um, they took attendance. And obviously, this is the first time that I had ever played for the team. So there's a spot for a name, phone number, address, and nickname. Obviously, I, I was not on the team before, so I did not yet have a nickname. Um, so I left that space blank. Um, this young man, and I, I could, for the life of me, could not tell you what his real name is, but he wrote down Maverick in the nickname spot. Um, he was quite the Top Gun fan, as I recall. Um, so our president at the time... 
uh, was a gentleman named Ronnie. He had never gotten a nickname. He's just Ronnie. Um, came up and said, well, Maverick. Who the heck is Maverick? And this little freshman kind of sheepishly held up his hand. And he goes, Maverick. Bah. You know, forget that. Your name's Dingleberry from now on. So, you know, we follow rule. What's what's it all mean? Yeah, I'll leave some time for you to laugh. Laugh it up. Have a good time. Um, wh- what does this all mean? We leave some time for rules. We leave some time for the way that we treat other people. We adhere to customs. You know, um, I would not go to the Middle East and to, you know, the Arabian Peninsula and wipe my bottom with the Quran because I know that the Quran is a sacred book to um, Muslims. And I know that it, that would be like a Muslim wiping his behind with the Eucharist to me. Uh, so we, we adhere to customs. Um, where are we? Oh, here we are in 24. Categorical imperative comes from the nominal realm. All right, so it all fits back together. Again, the nominal is not something that we understand. It's not something that we can deal. It's the opposite of everything that we know. Uh, so if the hypothetical is best expressed in the golden rule, um, and therefore, if, if I do this, then I can expect this. If I am nice to somebody else, I can expect that they should be nice to me. But we know that the world doesn't always work like that. We know that the occasionally, in, in a perfect world, you know, everybody would play nice and, and everybody would share their toys and their blocks and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there would be no need for us to say things like, well, there are often times that I am nice to somebody else and they are not nice to me. So the categorical imperative steps in where the hypothetical imperative drops off. Um, the categorical imperative is Kant's major contribution, and it's the idea that we ought to do something based on our intuitions, our emotions, our hopes, our desires, and our dreams, not simply because of what we get. All right, so this is where Kant is called a deontologist, and I asked you guys to watch a little short video clip about deontology um, that would help to explain what this means. Deontology is a ethical tradition that states that they're not concerned about the result of your actions, all right? So, for instance, there's a guy named John Stuart Mill who talks about utilitarianism, which might be something that's familiar to you. And in utilitarian thought, um, you always make the decision that benefits the most amount of people, regardless of what it does to others. All right, so if you can save 99 people by killing one, then you would make the best moral decision by killing that one person. Kant does not believe in that. He believes that with a categorical imperative that we need to have a couple different ideas as to how society can be perfective. All right, so let's go into the first maxim. And this is, as I said, mentioned, I tried to mention before, deontology is therefore a system of ethical beliefs that is not concerned with the outcome. It has instead um, its own tradition, if you, not tradition, it has instead its own set of rules, regardless of how the other person asks. <coughs> So in that sense, you are, as he would call you, your own moral agent, and you cannot be swayed by other people's actions. All right, so let's go on to 